most important phases of life, learning, earning, returning. It's a cycle of life. Once you learn, then you take the stuff that you have learned and you start earning, earning with it, earning, earning, earning. One of the most frustrating things in the world is to feel that God has given you some nuggets in your head. You learned something and you've got gold in your head, but you don't have any gold in your pocket. And you're trying to figure out how do I translate the gold that's up here and make it gold right here. Uh, learn and then earn. You have to always be able to, to transform your learning into earning. I have met a lot of educated people that don't know how to make knowledge work for them. Uh, you get paid for what you know. Are you listening? Not for what you don't know. You get paid for what you know. You have to know how to make knowledge work for you. You learn and then you earn and then you return the three phases of life. Learn, earn, return. But you're in the yoke with Jesus, with the big ox. And every time that he grazes to eat, to say, come learn of me, come and earn, he's got to feed you. You've got to feed. You have to ask yourself, when am I taking the time to actually allow him to feed me? When I want to feed when he's feeding. There's Jesus on the inside of you that needs to feed. He needs to feed. He needs to worship. And so we have to stop. We, we have to just stop. He orders our stops, and he also orders our steps. And he blesses us as we, as we move with him. And we have to move or else we'll have broken relationship. Broken relationship. You're in the yoke with him, and we have to learn. One of the best ways to learn is to get in relationship with somebody. You will learn a whole lot. What is better than reading a book is to have relationship with an author. Because then you can make the, the knowledge more relevant to you. You can ask specific questions as it pertains to you. Get to know the author of the book. Get to know the author of the book. The author of the book, because there are gonna be certain things that are general in the book, but when you know the author, the author can specifically tell you, this is not your time. You wait on me. Because otherwise, you will be tempted to accept that which is good, and good is always the enemy of that which is best. And you will compromise with a settling spirit on something that is good, but it is not God's best. And when you learn to wait on God, you see that the big ox will say, you know, I, I, know, I know it's exciting. I know you want to take that because you're hungry. But he said, just hold up. I got something bigger and better coming down the pike for you. If you'll wait on me, if you'll wait. Now, if he tells you to take that one, go ahead and get it. Because there are times that he'll take you just in stages and he'll let you enjoy things on this level until something greater on another level comes and he'll just take you step by step. But the key is, is to be discerning enough to follow the leading of God. You don't ever know when he's going to move and when he's going to stop. You have to be yoked in the relationship with him. There are times that you'll get ready to try to correct something with your mouth and the big ox will tell you, shut your mouth, keep it moving, don't say anything, this is not the time. You'll mess up everything that I'm trying to do if you go to running your mouth and let frustration come out. Let patience have her perfect work in you. There are some people that are sent to try you in your patience. Now let me just tell you this. If you need patience, guess what God will do? He will create the most impatient people around you in the impatient situations and circumstances. That's the only way to develop patience is to cause you to have to wait. You know, if you need to mature in the area of love, guess what he will do? He will bring some of the most cantankerous, evil people around you who are so unlovable. And that's where you will learn how to develop your love, somebody with an old stink attitude. He really will. He will use somebody who has the worst attitude, but you are in the yoke with Jesus. And he says, come on, learn of me. Learn of me. Come on, learn of me. He will yoke you. I'm just telling you, your relationships have the ability to make you or break you. It's the law of the inner circle that those closest to you determine your destiny. Those closest to you. You're not only known by the company that you keep, you're known by the company that you shun. Those closest to you will determine your destiny. It is a true principle of life. It is a true principle of life. There's something about the face of the ox. I'm so glad. See, there are, the Bible is a symbol book. And it's talking about the face of a man. We've talked about that. The face of a lion. We've talked about that. But now we're talking about the face of this ox here where you have to work. 
You have to work. You have to work. Touch your neighbor. Say, you got to work. You have got to work. You've got to work. There's no, there's, there's no way around it. I know it may be unpleasant, but listen, guess what happens if you don't work? You know another, you know another word for when you really understand? You're talking to an etymologist now. But dysfunctional means not working. It means not working. If you have a dysfunctional relationship, a dysfunctional household, that means it's not working. Whatever's going on here is not working. We were designed to work. You are engineered for excellence. You were designed to work. You were designed to work. I'm just telling you, I know some wealthy folks, and some of them, they actually got to a position so young and uh, don't have to work another day in their life, call themselves retiring, going to get on a yacht and sail around the world and play golf every day and do all this kind of stuff, and in, within three months, all of them got bored. You know why? Because we are designed to work. We're designed to work. You're designed to work. Now, I know that some people look at some other people and talk about successful folks, and they feel like they're lucky. Yeah, absolutely. You will find out that the harder you work, the luckier you'll be. You really will. Now, write luck as an acronym down in your paper, L-U-C-K. Write it vertically, vertically, L-U-C-K, because luck simply means labor under correct knowledge. It's labor under correct knowledge. Don't just work hard, work smart. You have to labor under correct knowledge. Now, that, so the question is, what is it that I need to, to know? That I need to be operating on a certain level because you're gonna get paid based on, the, on your mindset, where your mind is set. You get paid for the level of problems that you solve. Are you listening? So there's something that has to happen here. That, that, that is going to change some things. Labor under correct knowledge. There's something that you need to know. There's something that you need to know. And, and let me just say this to you, that God is not going to just bless you because you pray. Wouldn't that be wonderful if we could just pray and then boom, pow. Money just starts coming from everywhere. No, no, no. It, it, it doesn't work that way. Uh, you pray and then you go to work. You ask God to bless your way. You, you ask him to bless as you sow your seed. But you see, if you have sown no seed, you can expect no harvest. So you ask God to prosper only what you're willing to do. Notice Psalm 1. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. That means that if he's not willing to do anything, it will not prosper. Now, I'm going to tell you a little story of what happened today. I'm not going to call any names to protect the innocent. For those to whom I'm speaking, they know, but I'm just not the kind of person that would expose a person. But a certain person driving a vehicle today ran out of gas. I happened to be driving near them. They ran out of gas in the parking lot of a gas station. And the needle in the car was working, but they ran out of gas in the parking lot of a gas station. Now, I got out of my car to go to help push their car. And nobody came to help until I got out of the car trying to push the car. Nobody will come to help you until they see you pushing. Are you listening? Now, and let me tell you this. After they saw me pushing, then another wonderful lady who's a member of this church and another wonderful lady, who's a member of this church, saw their bishop out pushing a car, and they said, oh my God, no, bishop. <laughs> and I'm going to tell you, these women had eaten their Wheaties. <laughs> they just came out, the car was burning hot, you know, I'm on the thing, it's like a, a, I could fry an egg on the 
on the hood. It was burning up. I'm like, I can't even keep my hands on. I felt like I needed some blood. These women took that thing barehanded. So <laughs> <laughs> but now let me tell you that had the bishop not been out pushing, praying until something happened, you know, praying while I'm up. Listen, you got to push while you pray. You pray and you push at the same time. You pray and you push. God, help me. God, give me strength. You know, you got to do all of that. You got, you got to work. It's faith and works. But no help came until I got out of the car and started pushing. Nobody's going to help you until they see you pushing. You, we don't, you don't feel good about helping folks when they're too lazy to participate in the process of their own deliverance. So roll up your sleeve and, and I'm telling you that the best hands that you will ever find, the helping hands, are at the end of your own elbows. And so if you do that, somebody else then will become encouraged to then come and, and help you. And so two ladies came and then a man came. And so it got easier. And then another man came. But had nobody ever gotten out and started pushing, nobody would have ever come. Had we just been out with the hood raised, nobody would have just come to help us push. We needed a push. And so one person has got to start the pushing process, and then another will come. Your help, you will attract help when people see you doing everything that you can do. And so doing that and then two ladies came and then a man came and then another man came and let me just tell you as the more you work the harder that you push the better that the help that God will send you it started off with two women and then God sent one man and then he sent another man then he sent a man with a truck who had a gas can I mean the help just kept getting better it kept getting better and finally he already had gas in his gas can good help so then we stopped and just poured gas in the car the car cranked up we pulled it up to the what do you call the thing to the pump I'm just here to tell you that if you ever feel like you're running out of gas and stuck out in the middle of the street don't just sit there get out of the car and start pushing, start working on something and you'll attract somebody that'll say, my God, look at that poor little lady, look at that gray-haired bishop out there trying to push a car and somebody will help you if they see you pushing, working on something, trying to get it in its proper place. But if you don't do anything, you will inspire nobody else to do anything. And your help will get better and better and better and better. You will never start off as good as it can get. The only place that you start out on top is when you're digging a hole and it's all downhill from there. So I just want you to know that there's a reason I felt like an ox today. There's a reason that you have to push some things because you need to attract the help. And it's almost like if you're ever trying to get a government grant, you've got to prove to them that you can do it without them before you can get their help. They want to see that you got something vested in this thing. What are you going to put in it? If you ever think that somebody else is going to finance your dream, you better wake up and smell some real strong coffee and ammonia and, and uh, everything else. Because it's just not going to happen that somebody's just going to drop money out of the sky and just come and say, you know, the Lord told me to write a check and to pay for your whole dream. It won't work that way. You're going to be struggling with something right on the level where you are doing the best that you can do with it. And somebody will see you out pushing it, trying to get it in place, trying to make it work, trying to hold everything together. And because somebody sees you struggling, they will become inspired to help you. But you know, it's real hard to get people to help you if you're sitting there in the air conditioning and trying to tell people, uh, excuse me, excuse me, get in the front and push me. But when you are willing to get out, and when you're willing to work and to push, God will send you help. God will send you help. And the help becomes better and better. And the more that come to help, then the easier that the process will become. But if you will sit there and never get out and start pushing, you'll never get the help 
that you need. And there are too many people that never get any help because they're embarrassed over their problem. And until you can get over your little embarrassment, you will never be able to attract the real help that you so desperately need. And that's why one of the faces of this creature was the face of an ox. I hope that I'm helping to bring the scriptures alive to you in a way that you realize that this is something that God wants me to understand that I'm going to have to work like an ox. I got this from a, from a dear lady. She said that every woman needs to know four things. How to dress like a girl, how to act like a lady, how to think like a man, and how to work like a dog. And you'll be surprised. That when people see you doing the best that you can possibly do, they are inspired to help you. And when you are faithful in little things, doing the best that you can right on the level where you are, you will be surprised. You will be surprised. You will be surprised what God will do. I started my ministry in my public high school where there were uh, me and four other people. There were just five of us. But you know, I ministered to those five as though I was dealing with 5,000. And if you'll ever just start pushing with whatever you have, I didn't know nearly as much as I know now, but I pushed with everything that I had. You gotta push with everything that you got at the time because all of the stuff that you need in order to get what you want is right up your own sleeve. And if you'll get out and start pushing, there is a face of an ox where you got to have a mind to work. A mind to work because when the walls of Jerusalem were in ruin, the people, the Bible said, had a mind to work. You know what an attitude is? An attitude is a frame of mind. It's a frame of mind. Have you ever met people with a frame of mind where they just don't have the mind to work and they're always griping and complaining? You know what the root word of the word misery is? It is the word miser. And a miser is a stingy person. Every miser that I know is miserable. Every miser. And they want great things to come to them, but they don't want to do anything that requires something great. If you want uncommon results in your life, you must have uncommon practice. You've got to be able to work like an ox. And you get yoked with somebody who knows what they are doing. Please be mentored by somebody who knows what they are doing. Get mentored by somebody who knows what they're doing. Don't you all try to figure it out together and both of you are just, you know, I mean the blind can't lead the blind else they both fall into the, the ditch. That's scripture. That is, I didn't make that up. It is scripture. You get, they, the pattern in the Old Testament was to always yoke a seasoned ox with a young baby ox to teach them the ropes, the ways of life, when to move and when to bow down and eat, when to rest, when to hold it, and when to pull and when to stop. The big ox trains the young one and without saying a word, you begin to learn when to move even when you know, you don't have to go telling people, you know, uh-uh, wait, uh -uh, wait, child, so I feel something in my spirit. I think God telling me to stop. <laughs> it'll just be a knowing. It, it'll just be a knowing. I mean, something on the inside of you, it'll just, it, it'll say rest. It, it, it'll just say rest. I, I don't think that I need to do anything further right at this moment. I just need to chill. And, and he's saying that there's a dimension of us that once you're in the, in the dimension of just a man and doing the things that men and women do, that's, that's one side of us. Another dimension is when something is wrong in your life and you need to correct it and you need to have the boldness of a lion. And that's another dimension, that face of a lion to deal with unpleasant situations that need to be confronted in your life. And the other is this face of this ox who is willing to work. And there are times when things that need to get done, that you need people that have the face of an ox. 
And when you get behind in responsibilities, you need to have the face of an ox. And when it's time to clean up, you got to put on the face of an ox. And you have to get the job done. When you've got people that will put on the face of that ox, where they've been trained, you can tell trained people. You save time when you get trained. You don't waste as many resources when you get trained. And there's a reason that he would yoke the experience with the inexperience. That he would yoke wisdom with foolishness. God has a plan. He's up to something. He's not going to yoke two fools together. He will yoke people together who need each other. Where this one has something that this one needs and that one has something that that one needs. It's amazing that in the best working relationship, God pulls people together where opposites attract. One person is always on time, the other person is always late. And this one is talkative, this one is quiet all the time. This one is passive, this one is aggressive. I mean, you can't have both passive people. They go in a restaurant and they order a piece of chicken and then the chicken is bleeding. And then it's like, oh, oh no, don't, no don't, don't send it back. to I, I, I don't want to upset them. They might spit in my food. But the aggressive person is like, excuse me, can you throw this back on the grill? You need somebody that's going to speak up. God is going to yoke people together where they become a complement. It, it, it's, it's just beautiful. There, there's some people that are just wonderful, wonderful thinkers, and they're very calculating about a particular thing, everything very, very precise. And then the other people that are just great dreamers, you know, oh, we could go to Tahiti, and we could just be there. And then the pragmatists just say, how are we going to Tahiti? How are we going to get the time off of work? Who's going to pay these bills? And we're going to come back? And, and it's the two here that's coming together. And, and, and the realists needs the dreamer, and the dreamer needs the realist. They bring a balance to each other. They are not there to compete with each other, they're there to complete one another because of their diversity. You don't marry somebody just like you, they would irritate the tar out of you. You have to marry somebody that is a complement to the things that you don't have in yourself. We are drawn to qualities in others that we don't have in ourselves, and that balances our lives in a wonderful way. And so there's something that the big ox has that the little ox doesn't have. And so Jesus said, I want you, you're tired, you're frustrated, come unto me. All of you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. But it's not the kind of rest that you think about. This rest is not act, uh, inactivity. It is a change of activity. I'm going to let you rest from what you've been doing, but you're getting ready now to roll up your sleeve, and I'm going to make you now... Uh, You've been fishing f for fish, now I'm going to make you fishers of men. I'm going to change your focus. I'm going to bring real meaning and purpose into what you're doing. I'm going to connect something eternal. I'm going to bring heaven and earth and mix a, a, bring a divine mixture of both dust and divinity. I'm getting ready to breathe on what you have been doing in your flesh. I'm getting ready to bring my super on your natural. And I'm going to make you incredible. I'm going to give you tenacity, strength, focus. I'm going to begin to bless you in dimensions that you have not seen before. I'm going to do something brand new in your life. And I just want you never to be afraid of the face of the ox. I wouldn't have gotten through school as rapidly as I did if I didn't put on the face of an ox. It wasn't the eagle that I needed. It wasn't the lion that I needed. It wasn't the face of a man. It was the face of an ox because I had a mind to work. And when things need to be done, you don't complain about how long it may take and how much is there to be done. You have a mind to work. As long as it takes, I'm going to get the job done, whatever it takes. By any means necessary, whatever it takes, I've got to get the job done. That's what an ox does. An ox does not give an excuse. And he is yoked in with somebody who knows the field. The field is too wide. There's not enough time for you to figure out everything in the field alone. You need to be yoked with somebody who's been across this field a little while and knows. They, they know how to, to make straight rows. They know how to pull it in the right dimension. They know when to slow down. They know when to turn. They know when to bow to eat to renew their strength. 
And when you're in the relationship with the big ox, there are times when your spirit might become frustrated and impatient, and the big ox will say, it's time to pray. We've got to feed here. It's not about doing man stuff now. We've got to graze. And, and graze means praise. It means pray. It means praise God. It means meditate on things from the Word of God. It means get life on the inside of you because something supernatural is getting ready to happen in your life. Well, I hope that you understand the face of the ox a little better. Thank you for watching Power for Living with Bishop Dale C. Bronner. Until next time, God bless you.